Hello listeners and welcome to the Afriweta podcast where we look to celebrate African history, people and culture by telling our story. As always, our hope is that it fills you with enough curiosity to go and do your own deeper research. Whilst I have you, if you're new to the Afriweta world, karibuni sana, please check out previous Afriweta episodes which can be found on this podcast platform. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we're headed to the eastern region of our continent to look at a people who are surrounded by mystery. The Bachwezi dynasty, the rulers of the Chitara Empire. Chitara spelled K I T A R A. At its core, Afriwetu is about pre-colonial African history. And so today, we're looking at this ancient dynasty and their place in our history. Please remember to visit us on our interwebs. Our handle is at Afriwetu, where we shall be posting interesting facts, stories, updates, and links for further study for all you lovely people. For now, just sit back and enjoy the journey. Now, before we head over to the Batwezi, let us take a moment to go back to their predecessors, the Batembuzi. Those whose reign is believed to have begun in about the 11th century. Now, although these ancestors, the Batembuzi, were shrouded in even more mystery, and they were linked to being a mythical people, we're still able to get a decent enough picture of them and the civilization that they ruled over. But those are details for yet another episode. For now, we shall just take a quick look, just so as to give a bit of context. So the term Batembuzi is said to translate to pioneers or harbingers. In the past, there were those who dismissed their reign, claiming it was not well documented in comparison to other civilizations. But wiser heads have prevailed, and today we see a great deal has been derived from oral histories and scholarly research, including archaeological finds. One such example of this archaeological find has been used to support the claim that they introduced the, this is a very tough word to say, Uruhururara Mbitse, cattle, with exceptionally long horns, more commonly known as the Ankole cows. Fossils that date over 800 years have been uncovered in the region. There are also historical records showing the migration of the Batembuzi to the Interlacustrian, which is basically a fancy word that means the area between lakes. And in this instance, we're talking about the Great Lakes region in Eastern Africa, where there are about 15 lakes. After the Batembuzi dynasty, there are another two dynastic sets of rulers in the region. The Bachwezi, who ruled Chitara at its height in the 14th century, and the focus of today's show, and then the Babito dynasty, who ruled the Bunyoro Chitara from the 16th century, which will be covered in the next Civilization episode, so keep tuning in. So, why have we spent any time on the Batembuzi when I said we'll be learning about the Batwezi? To be fair, I think the Batembuzi were fascinating people shrouded in mystery and also important as the originators of one of the great African empires, the Chitara. And to speak of the Chitara empire and of the Batwezi without acknowledging them is just not right. Plus, I got to use the words harbinger and interlocustrian without sounding too pretentious. So, now we're all up to speed. Uh, For this next bit, I would suggest you get a map as I'm going to take you to the Chitara empire's modern location. So we start from Eastern DRC, go across to Rwanda and Burundi. From there, we will head north and right through Uganda up to southern South Sudan. From here, we then travel down to Western Kenya and we keep going until we hit northern Tanzania. And in fact, some accounts suggest that the influence of the Chitara spread all the way further south to Zambia and Malawi 
as well as spreading further north to Ethiopia. So it was a huge empire. Now we know where it is, let's take a quick look at the myth in terms of the origin tale. The mythical origin tale is genuinely quite something, and we do not have time to go into it on this show, but we will in an upcoming episode. So for now, I will give you a quick summary. They are said to be the direct descendants of King Isaza. Isaza was the last ruler of the Batembuzi dynasty. Isaza went on a quest to the underworld, and whilst he was there, he met the ruler of the underworld, King Nyamionga, and was introduced to the princess Nyamate. He fell in love, as you do, and shortly he and Nyamate had a son, Isimbwa. Isimbwa then fathered Ndahura who became the first Mukwezi ruler of the Chitara Empire. This myth actually lends to the Batwezi being seen to possess supernatural powers and considered demigods at their time. It also fueled the idea that they were magical beings and the people at that time worshipped the ruling class based on these beliefs. The myth does go further and tells of the end of the Batwezi with the most common versions claiming that they disappeared into the lake. The favoured ones being either Lake Wamala, in modern-day south of Uganda, or Lake Mitanzige. I hope I said that right, Mitanzige. So now we've had a glimpse into the myth, let's look at the more tangible story. The Bachwezi are still till today considered to be a mystery in terms of their origins, and scholars and historians still debate certain aspects of where they came from. Chitara was also known as the Empire of the Sun, Moon, or Light, depending on where you came from, and it is claimed to have been the successor states to the great states from the northeast after they went into decline, and so the people moved south to claim new territories. So we then have modern scholars who believed that they arrived in the area at around circa 500 AD from the River Nile into Western Uganda from these northern territories, which lends to the belief held by peoples in the Rwandan Eastern DRC area that see the Chwezi as an ancient race who were directly linked to the Kush or Nubian royalty. We then have the scholars who say that they came from the Aksum Empire. And when it went into decline, and move south. Aksum being the area around Ethiopia, Eritrea, etc., which, yes, we will talk about it in another show. So, the Bashwezi dynasty, according to tradition, ruled for over a century over Chitara, up until the 16th century. In that time, they established their capital at Bigobia, Mugeni. Based on archaeological findings, this capital was not only an urban center, but also the administrative core of the empire. They are credited with turning the Batembuzi state into the Chitara Empire. And although the description of their dominion as an empire and the territorial extent are disputed, one thing isn't. And that is, despite the short timeline, their impact was significant. They are credited with performing supernatural feats and with exercising effortless dominion over those who came into contact with them. So let's take a peek at their society and governments. The people are described as being remarkably tall with dark brown skin and elongated heads. The Bachwezi are regarded as really advanced for their time and were considered a highly intelligent people. They are credited with creating, amongst other things, the complicated Mankala board game, Omweso, a game that was played by the nobility of the day and is still played today in Uganda and actually was once said to be a favorite of Kabaka Mutesa I from Buganda. Listeners, I will not lie to you. I try to understand it. 
and I failed miserably because I wanted to explain it to you here, but uh, I'll keep trying, but I advise you to go and check it out for yourself. And in addition, there are also very many types of Mankala games that Africans created. So let us know which ones you know of using our social media handle. The Bachwezi were also known for their prowess in hunting, archery and wrestling, which they indulged in for sport and recreation. Their physical agility saw that they were highly skilled in combat. Paradoxically, despite being highly skilled in this, they were described as being pacifists and did not glorify conflict. This goes as far as a claim that when they used to come back from battle, they actually used to retreat and stay away from society for a period of time. The people were also closely associated with the long-horned cattle of the region. I'm not going to try and say that name again. And as with their predecessors, the Batimbuzi, they were considered proficient farmers for agriculture and dairy. As part of their contribution, they were industrialists and introduced coffee farming and iron smelting to the area. So therefore, their economic mainstay was cattle rearing, iron smelting, and in addition, some trading of salt. The Bachwezi introduced the concept of hegemony, basically a fancy term which means placing the management of a civilization under a single monarch or ruler. From that, they then set out and organized a social structure that they brought with them from their original homelands into the Intelacustrum. The empire relied on agents who would represent the Mkwezi in the region, as military might was not enough for such a wide area. This administration also compensated for the weakness in quick communication from the center to the conquered lands. It also served to keep bureaucracy and diplomacy on track with these same lands. So, we're going to have a quick look at the rulers, but before we just step into them, let's just have a, a peek at their origins. So according to oral history, one of the Baranzi clan, Bukuku, provides the link between the Batembuzi and the Bachwezi dynasties. Bukuku is said to have taken over from the last Batembuzi, King Isaza. Bukuku's ascent to the throne was resisted by the nobility and local rulers. And there were various reasons for this. He was not part of the royal family. And then he was not even from the right family, being a Baranzi. And then to make matters worse, he was considered a cruel man. There is the tale, actually, of how he deliberately disfigured his only daughter, Nina Muiru, out of paranoia that her beauty would mean a man would fall in love with her, father a child, and then that child would usurp Bukuku, as was foretold by the soothsayers. So cruel was a bit of an understatement. He said to, either which way, have crushed the rebellion, but this did not stay the rumblings of a revolution. And indeed, the revolution happened. He did not last long, and he was succeeded by Mukwezi Ndahura. All in all, there were three noted Bachwezi rulers. We've already heard Ndahura, then there was Mulindwa, and Wamala, in that order. Their reign actually started and ended with the Chitara Empire, which collapsed in the 16th century. So, looking at the rulers, we have Ndahura, who was the first ruler of the Chitara Empire. He was the child, get this, of Isimbwa, Isiza's son, I hope you guys were listening in the beginning, and Nyinamwiru, Bukuku's daughter, and the recognized grandchild of Bukuku Omuranzi. The soothsayers were right. He was a great warrior who founded the Bachwezi dynasty. And on coming to the throne, he went on to gain allies as well as crush those who had fought against his grandfather. He even brought his kin from up north to support his rule. One of his first campaigns was against the Bungoma, capturing then killing the ruler Nsinga. And buoyed by this, he went on to lead successful campaigns across the region, from Karagwe to the Madi County. Dahura's successful campaigns, however, did not last. And he suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of Ingahiro in Bukoba. His fate after this defeat and subsequent release is up for debate. But what is clear, though, 
was that he did not wish to go back to the capital in disgrace, as a defeat was a fate worse than death. And then, to compound matters, his defeat was linked to a bad omen, an eclipse. It is said that when the soldiers saw the eclipse and knowing the connotation, fled in terror, abandoning him. So here he was, defeated, abandoned, and seemingly cursed. It was really not a good look for a ruler, so he's said to have just packed up and gone west. He was succeeded by Mulindwa. Now, Mulindwa was actually said to be a regent who used to rule when Dahura was away conquering more lands for the empire. And he was claimed to be Dahura's half-brother. He was relatively successful until his untimely death, rumored to be at the hands of two princesses, Nyateza and Nyangoro, after which a civil war ensued until Wamala was placed on the throne. Now, Wamala, our last Batwezi king, was actually Ndahura's son. His court and advisors consisted of senior priests and military commanders. During his reign, there was a great upsurge in migrants to the empire, from the Bahima from the Agoro mountain region, the Bantus from Kintu area in the east, to the Bashambo from the south, and the Luo from the north. Wamala decided he's going to leverage on these new entrants into the empire, giving them important political positions because he recognized the risk they presented and to mitigate it, he made appointments such as Miramira, Rugo and Kinyoni from the Bashambo and the Balisa clans. He gave them the territory to manage around Lake Masioro. He had Kagoro from the Luo put as a military commander, which if you think about it, it's quite a leap of faith to put both land and army in foreigners' hands. He then went on to put Amuhima in charge of the royal herds. Cattle, you see, were not just a source of economy, but they were also held in very high regard. In fact, there was a sacred cow called Bihogo, whose life was linked to the state of the empire. So it was no small feat to be put in charge of a royal herd. Wamala even went as far as having a blood brotherhood with the head of the Bantu clans. Gantu. And this tactic did actually work for a period, but as we know, nothing lasts forever. And as we shall now see how this Bachwezi dynasty came to an end and how with it came the end of the Chitara Empire. So, prophecy was that upon the death of the Bihogo, the sacred cow, the empire would crumble. The cow did indeed die, but Call me crazy, I'm not convinced that that was the reason behind the Bachwezi's end. There were more practical reasons. So, for example, Wamala was not considered a particularly strong ruler and was unable to protect his people from the advances of invaders, which is probably why he made the concessions in appointing foreigners in such high political posts. And speaking of state foreigners, one in particular, Kagoro, remember him, of the Luos? He put him in charge of the military? Well, it is claimed that he went ahead and staged a very bloody coup d'etat, killing many of the Bachwezi nobility. As a quick aside, some claim that they then threw the bodies into the lakes, Lake Mitanzige or Lake Wamala, are the two favorite options. And this is what probably fueled the myth the Bachwezi disappeared into the lakes and in the thick of night, poof, they were gone. Well, the story that is a bit closer to the truth is that following the collapse and following this defeat, the Bachwezi made their escape to other parts of the fallen empire and got assimilated into today's Bahim of the Ankole and the Batusi, just to name a few. The defeat also left this weakened state of Chitara open to being taken over during the Luo invasion led by Isingoma 
Rukidi Mpunga, who found a land that had been ravaged by war and strife. And yes, again, there's another prophecy that said the end would come to the empire with the invasion of dark-skinned people from the north. There were lots of prophecies at this time. Either way, this dilapidated empire was ripe for the taking, and the capital was easy to overrun, and it was a final straw, and the empire fell. So just to summarize, I chose this dynasty as it was really fascinating to read about the rulers of the mighty Chitara Empire. Like their ancestors, the Basembuzi, there's a lot more in terms of oral history, which has been passed on from generation to generation, which is rich with interpretation about the Bachwezi. The rich mystery and intrigue surrounding the Bachwezi was very interesting, especially as their legacy is still strong across the region, with many a fable and folklore as to their disappearance. In fact, in modern Uganda, many traditional deities in Toro, Bunyoro, and Buganda still have the Bachwezi names like Ndahura, Mulindwa, and Wamala. And further to that, there are claims by the Bahima of the Ankole, the Batutsi, and the Buhuma of the Toro, who claim to be direct descendants, which is probably due to the Bachwezi being assimilated into these nations. This dynasty had quite an influence even in their time, as we see as far away as Ife and Mali in West Africa. There are folk tales about the nation of the Chwezi from across the continent. And we find similar stories of the Bachwezi found in Southern Africa, specifically from the San people. It was a very difficult topic to grasp in terms of the research, as there were very, 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 very many varied versions of the Bachwezi dynasty. So what is in this episode is the information that the majority of the scholarly and historical texts agreed on. I would really encourage all listeners to dig deeper and let us know what their own research has found as the subject is so vast and really worth a proper deep dive. We shall explore the successor kingdom of Bunyoro Chitara, as well as the mythical origins of the Ochezi in the upcoming episodes. So please tune in for those. They will be announced on all our interwebs. I had a lot of fun with this episode, and I hope that with its equal dose of fact and folklore, I do hope that you also enjoy this journey with me about this mysterious dynasty. And until next time, Mubarikiwe. I'm not